is Frank Schaefer. I am at a conference with a group called Unrig the System, uh, gathering to try to get Citizen United and other rulings that corrupt American politics overturned, whether it's by constitutional amendment or just electing better representatives who will appoint better judges. But the fact of the matter is, it is also part of the resistance against Trump because corporate America has been empowered by Trump in a way nothing else has. So I will be conducting a series of interviews with people here, speakers and others who are really the kind of citizens that are going to have to come together to change this country. Thanks. My name is Frank Schaefer. This is Frank Schaefer and I am talking to someone that I find very interesting and inspiring and I would like her to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about what she does. I think it has a lot to do with resisting the Trump administration right now and beyond that far bigger issues of corruption in the US government from the top to the bottom in terms of money and all the rest of it. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, hello, my name is Tara Hauska. I am an attorney and was formerly based in Washington DC. Now at Minnesota, I'm Anishinaabe from Kuching First Nation and the National Campaigns Director of Honor the Earth, an indigenous-led environmental justice organization. Tell me a little bit about your experience in protesting the pipeline and how you saw corruption manifesting itself there. Sure, so I uh, left Washington, D.C. in 2016 and went out to stand with my brothers and sisters um, who were fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota. and got a first-hand look at exactly what corruption really is um, when you see unarmed people being beaten by police officers, uh, being hit with water cannons, being attacked by dogs, um, hit with rubber bullets, concussion grenades, I mean permanent damage done to people's bodies who were unarmed by law enforcement. Um, all these things happen on behalf of law enforcement um, to protect a corporate interest in a pipeline. How do you see that fitting in with this kind of general corruption of corporate power being so much more powerful than individuals' rights now in America? It didn't matter what color you were in Standing Rock. It didn't matter what your background was. If you were a, a quote-unquote protester or if you were an attorney or a doctor or whoever it was, at the end of the day we were all treated the same and that was less than human beings. Um, and we saw this huge effort um, using things like counterintelligence firms like Tiger Swan to infiltrate our camps, um, these peaceful people to paint us as jihadist terrorists, um, the effort by you know, the administration now currently to say that people that resist these projects peacefully exercising our constitutional rights are terrorists. Um, I mean, it's an all-out system that's meant to uh, suppress anyone who dares to stand against a corporation. How do you think this fits in with Trump's appointing people at all these agencies who seem to be wanting to undo them from the inside, including consumer protection and most recently even an agency that was there to protect people against discrimination in lending practices? I mean, just crazy stuff. How does this fit in with your general view of what's going on? I mean, when I saw the former CEO of Exxon get appointed to be the head of the State Department, I think that was a good tone for what Donald Trump was going to put into uh, power in his administration. We've seen a systematic dismantling of so many different systems that are meant to address really basic government functions beyond just environmental protection. I mean, we're talking education, consumer protection, like you mentioned, so many different aspects of what the government is supposed to do as a system. Um, being led by people who fundamentally do not agree or believe in those systems, who benefit off the destruction of those systems. Um, you know, we saw someone get, uh, I used to intern at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. The head of that, of that the, who he pointed to that agency, who's responsible for the National Environmental Policy Act, is a woman who doesn't believe climate change is real. You know, who doesn't understand what rising seas are being questioned directly by the federal government and by, by the Senate committee and having no responses because she has to look into it. I mean, these are the people that he's putting in charge. So I'm seeing a, a f these systems that already, already had their flaws really being dismantled. You and I share something, and that is a, an evangelical uh, conservative background. I left mine, and it, it boggles my mind that the white evangelical vote you know, you can say whatever you want about Russia's involvement or Hillary was a weak candidate or the Bernie brothers or whatever. The fact of the matter is without the white evangelical vote, the moral majority vote that my father 
uh, helped start with Jerry Falwell back in the day. And uh, before we all got, I got out of all that stuff, I was part of that. How does this all fit in? I mean, these guys used to represent morality, and now they are shills for corporate America. They are part of what the Koch brothers are doing. They don't even believe in global warming. They, they challenge no, climate change. What's going on? Somehow these... That's these, part of your background no, too, right? No, somehow these basic values of, of, okay, so Christian principles of brotherhood and kindness and empathy and taking care of the planet that, you know, God gave us, right? Like that's, those are basic tenets of Christianity. Um, to see that become this situation where you see people siding with a corporation over their fellow neighbor, or where you see people siding with someone that has a profit interest over someone else's like humanity. Um, you know, people gloating over their neighbors being deported to countries they've never been to. You what know, needs or, to change? Or countries because, that they've never known. I mean, it struck me with this Haiti being called a shithole country. You know, I remember donating to Christian groups that were sending doctors and nurses to help people in Haiti. Yeah, what's happened? I mean, these same guys vote for this racist. What has what what needs to be done from your point of view personally? What is your perspective? How do we change this? What do we do? I mean, on that particular aspect, I think that there still are many, many Christians who are following Christian values, who are doing things like missionary, um, you know, going around the world and trying to help people um, while also, I mean, honestly, it's also a form of colonization, but I think that we're at a place where we have to, as people, recognize that, you know, our fellow human beings matter more than corporations, that, you know, we have to have empathy for one another and actually care about one another. We've gotten so disconnected from each other and from the earth that we're seeing this, um, you know, extreme capitalism playing out in so many different aspects of our lives. And, you know, the almighty dollar is not more important than someone else's humanity. Just wrap up by talking a little bit about your own background, uh, your, your concerns and your involvement with the whole fight for some sort of recognition for Native Americans in, in this climate. Who I, are you? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm an indigenous person who has advocated on behalf of tribal nations around the country. I worked for Bernie Sanders and worked on, it was a lead author of his, of his tribal policy platform. Um, you know, I think indigenous peoples and our treatment of, in, uh, this country's treatment of indigenous peoples should be a good measure of where we're at as a people. Um, we are still at a place in this country where indigenous peoples aren't, first of all, are the genocide that took place is not acknowledged. You know, there, there was a genocide that took place and it, it's real and it continues to play through the generations. We have to acknowledge that, you know, indigenous peoples are dispossessed of so many basic rights that currently, as an indigenous woman, you know, one in three native women are, are going to be raped in her lifetime that tribes have lessened authority to prosecute non-native offenders so somehow we have a different form of justice within the united states borders um, that cannot be you know we cannot move forward while that's still a reality where can people reach you um, you can find me at honorearth.org or at stopline3.org uh, my plans in the immediate future are to continue resisting against this corporate takeover um, to defend my own people's lands, my our people's treaty territories against a destructive tar sands line, and to continue fighting for the for water for all generations, clean water for our futures. Are you thinking about running for office? I think at this particular moment, the greatest level of influence that I can have is on the ground, fighting yeah. with grassroots folks. Yeah, in things like the pipeline issue. Exactly. And others. But you've been in Washington. You have some experience. You would bring stuff to it. Absolutely, and the perspective of knowing exactly what those systems currently, how yeah. they operate. Yeah, um, it's great. It's, it's amazing to me that to see the level of pettiness that happens yeah. in our political systems. Yeah, <laughs> so. well, especially in light of the big stuff going on, like people getting shot with rubber bullets at the pipeline. Yeah. It seems like we've got... We and then you got people something. saying, I won't sign your bill because you didn't sign mine two years ago. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what okay, was that all about? what? <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about this conference where I um, unrigged the system. I, I, I've never, you know, I don't know much about it, but they had you as a speaker, so I'm presuming you know something about it. 
yeah, I think it's you know it's meant to be a coming together of um, different partisan groups and trying to actually figure out ways to have solutions, real solutions for what's going on. So yeah. this incredible influence of corporations into our governance structures, um, the disempowerment of so many different people, and the loss of the people's voice mm. in this system that's supposed to be about the people's voice. Yeah. So which has not been helped by Donald Trump appointing all his old corporate buddies and half the Wall Street operators. Absolutely not. You know, drain the swamp? Are you kidding? Like, that is not the case. He's filled it, packed it even even more full than it already was. Yeah. So, well, good yeah. talking with you. Nice meeting you. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you. Your name, who you are, what you do, and tell me about what you just talked about in here. What is this event that you're at? Right. So my name is Neo Weeks. I'm the director of policy and advocacy at Women with the Vision. Women with the Vision is a 28-year-old grassroots organization here in New Orleans that advocates with marginalized black women across the city, throughout the state, and across the South. Um, we advocate with women who are currently and formerly incarcerated, women who are homeless, women who participate in sex work, women who are um, just homeless and desperate and just want to be uh, more engaged in, in life in different ways. And so today we're at Unrigged, um, talking to community members about how the work that we do um, engaging marginalized black women and not just being able to sustain from day to day, but really becoming active and being part of the specific process because all the policy makers, every time that they make a decision um, or, or something that happens that affects their lives, whether it's um, being a part of the criminal justice system or, you know, even choosing what school where to live there are policy makers making decisions about that for them and with them and um, but don't represent who they are or what they feel or the, the things that are happening in their lives and don't even understand the intersectionality of how all of those things fit to allow them to make it from sunrise to sunset and um, and just not even really see them as full human beings that are really supposed to engage in this process and supposed to be a part of our community and so what we do is we work with them and take the issues that they tell us are important and figure out ways to strategically highlight them and then strategically have them be a part of that, that process, whether it's um, being a part of electing an official, whether it's um, bringing their voice to their issues to city hall, city council, to um, a state space, whether it's our state legislature or the national um, office and they meet, we brought people to meet with our federal legislators um, and centering their truth, centering their stories, centering their experience all the time because all the work that we do um, when we were talking about marginalized communities and all of this affects marginalized communities in a very specific way and so all of this um, needs to be driven by them it needs to be led by them they need to be the ones not just a part of the conversation or sitting at the table they need to be the ones who are the table and we're sitting out there with them and supporting them in the efforts that they're trying to do. I'm, I'm rigged. What, what is this that we're at? We're at a, a really awesome space that's bringing policymakers and people who are engaged in the political process from all walks of life. There are people like me that do um, advocacy with marginalized communities and grassroots things, and you have people who are um, business owners and business leaders, um, people from both sides of the aisle from all walks of life talking about how we can create a system that is more equitable and fair and inclusive of everybody in this country. Where where can people uh, contact you and find more of your work? Sure. Um, so Women with a Vision is the organization. My name is Nia Weeks. Um, you can find me. Um, I have a website, neaweeks.com. I also have a Black Woman Super PAC in C4 called Citizen She. And um, we advocate for women in the same way, just on a whole different level. Now, you had a success recently here, didn't you, in, in some legislation you were all talking about. Yes. Can you just tell me about that? Sure. We had 10 bills passed, crim crime reform bills, that were um, both uh, Republican and Democratically introduced. People from both sides of the aisle, um, business leaders community leaders, um, criminal reformists, all working together to get 10 bills passed that will reduce the um, jail population in Louisiana, hopefully moving us from the incarcerated capital of the world into a more systemic and equitable space. Ha have you ever thought of running for office? No. <laughs> because I'm going around the country interviewing candidates, yes. and I, I wish you were one. Oh, thank when you. When you do, tell me. Thank I'll come you. work for you. Oh, I love that. Thank you so <laughs> I really much. Will. Thank okay. you. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Um, I was born the first girl in my family in 50 years. I was a goddamn miracle. <laughs> to two of the kindest, most genuine brothers any girl could ever hope for. Except
Peter Willette. I'm from Pennsylvania, and I'm here at the Unrig Summit uh, to try to get corruption taken care of in, in, in our government. I'm working at the state level right now in Pennsylvania, which is the fifth most corrupt state in the nation. We really need to do some work at the state level to change that. Um, one of the main issues right now is gerrymandering. There are bills before the, the uh, state house, but they're stuck in committee. Two people are holding up the bills. Uh, it's a completely undemocratic, unrepublican, un-American process. Uh, we need to change it. We need to get the bills out of committee, and we need to get them uh, voted on. Hi, you recognize me? Where have you yes. seen my stuff? I've seen your stuff on YouTube and on Facebook. That's great. And, yeah. and what's your background other than what you're doing now? How'd you get into this? How did I get into this? Um, I kind of drilled down and figured out that money was the root of all evil. Yeah. And that's true. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, that's the, the major thing we have to get out of uh, our political system, or nothing is going to change. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Might get queasy, but even though states once required hemp farming, we've let corporations control. It's alarming. I'm disarming our usual tropes. Hi. I'm Sephora Letterman. I'm the communications director at Represent Us, and I'm here at Unrig the System Summit. And what are, what are we all doing here at, at Tulane University in New Orleans. Why am I here? Yeah, so everyone here is here for the same reason. They believe that the government should represent you and your family and regular people, not just the rich and powerful. So people are coming here, they're putting aside partisan divides, and they're working together on clear solutions to fix money and politics, to fix accountability and uh, ethics, to fix voting and elections, and to create fair districts. So we're working on clear solutions and real actions. And it's really exciting. This movement is becoming an unstoppable force in American politics. I'm meeting a lot of candidates running for office, and I've noticed there's both Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. How on earth have you put people that hate each other on the same platform? It's really interesting about this issue. You know, people are, are perfectly willing to put aside the things that divide them in so many other ways and focus on what brings them together, which is this desire to fix America's political crisis. And what is the crisis, for, aside from somebody like me who despises Donald Trump and I'm a <laughs> progressive and I come from a religious right background and uh, you bring all the baggage, but just lay that aside for a moment. If we, if we sat down together on an airplane and I said, you know, what is this crisis? Describe it, uh, not in jargon, but just tell me what you think the bottom line. Are we talking sure. big money in politics? Yeah, dark yeah. Dark money, so Citizens special United. Special interests, lobbyists, political elites, the political establishment, they've rigged the system with by giving donations, by having a disproportional amount of influence in politics. And they've made it so, you know, they've distorted the way candidates run for office. They've distorted the way we vote, and they've distorted the way politicians govern. And because of that, we have so many problems in this country. It's why healthcare is so expensive. It's why we put so many people in jail in this country. The root cause of so many of the issues that we face on both sides of the aisle, the regular Americans from across the political spectrum, we all are facing the same obstacles because the system works for the people in power. Tell me a little bit about the specifics of who all's on the platform. I've been very impressed with your platform. Mm -hmm. Your speakers, your participants. Just run through some of these guys with a, a thumbnail of who each one is. Sure, so we have some current elected officials from the left and the right. We have um, Tulsi Gabbard, who's a member of Congress um, from the left, and we have Mike Gallagher, a member of Congress on the right. We had former uh, presidential candidate and governor of Louisiana, Buddy Romer, who's from the right. We have some interesting in, uh, interest from influencers in the entertainment industry. Like who? Jennifer Lawrence was in our opening plenary yesterday, and she'll be speaking again tonight. And what brings all of them together? Are, are, are you guys just good at getting people to come together? I mean, what, what's the deal? You know, this movement... Because everyone will want to know who's behind you. Right. I mean, the cynicism of today. So There's a lot are, of you, are you part of Coke Industries? What's the deal? Here? No, I promise. No, we... This movement is bringing in people from you know all different kinds of backgrounds because we're all motivated by the same same thing, right? We all want to fix the system, and celebrities are here for the same reason as everyone else is. They want to roll up their sleeves and see what they can do to make it better. Yeah, and when you say make it better, you're talking about lobbyists, you're talking about Citizens United, you're talking hmm. about so we're all the talking about you know the grassroots movements across the country um, and people that are passing laws and building campaigns and working on ballot initiatives. 
for all sorts of democracy reforms. Do you ever talk about your own politics? I mean, obviously you vote. Uh, does mm -hmm. it matter or do you keep it sort of secret because you're trying to work with all these different people? I don't keep it a secret. I mean, what I do here is totally aligned with the rest of my political values. I care about people and I care about people having access to political power, having access to vote, and, and nothing about this is in conflict with that. Can I, can I ask you what those political leanings are? I'm just, my folks who watch my stuff will be interested. Sure, sure. So I don't, I don't subscribe to either party per se. I'm not like a diehard on either side. My views, you know, span the spectrum. I've been called conservative by some of my friends and I've been called way far out left by some other friends. So I really try to keep an open mind and there are some things that I feel very strongly about, but I haven't had to wrestle with any of those here because we're all here to just put that aside and focus on the shit that, sorry, That's the okay. stuff that we can solve My together. My audience here is worse from me. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you this. Do you ever get frustrated in terms of, you know, you hear about this generational divide and millennials mm. who don't vote and the Bernie Sanders crowd versus the Hillary crowd. I mean, and then all these folks who don't even register, you know, in terms of your demographic, your age group, what, what are you all doing to reach out on those sorts of issues, Get just mm -hmm. getting people involved? Right. So yeah, we're doing everything we can to reach out to young people. That's one of the reasons we're having it here on a college campus and a lot of students have been involved. Young people care. They're very engaged in politics. They just, you know, sometimes they feel like the system doesn't work for them and then that can lead to some apathy or some cynicism. But we're doing what we can to really energize people on both sides of the aisle and bring can, them into the movement. Can I just finish up by saying, as a, an old fart, white fart, old generation, I find it immensely encouraging to be talking to you today. Good, that's great. Yeah, that's what this is all about, like bringing I'm, people together from different backgrounds yeah, and, and, and bridging so, those divides. Listen, seriously, thank you for what you're yeah. doing. Thank you. Citizens United has allowed corporations to spend untold amounts of money into our system. And the 1%, their intent is basically to undermine the voices of those individuals who I represent. My name is Letitia James and I hail from New York City. I am the public advocate of the city of New York, the second highest position in the city of New York. And prior to that, I was a city council member who was elected on an independent line, you may know it, called the Working Families Party Line. <laughs> I do not represent the wealthy, and I don't want a government where only the wealthy represent our interest. I don't want a government of those individuals who were born into wealth, who are legacy children. I don't want a world where only those individuals who can sympathize with me represent the interest of the people that I represent. I don't want only those who have never known pain and struggle, who have never known sacrifice, I want our government to represent the interest of all Americans. And so I went into office as the city council member with no money. You see, my friends have no money. Most of them don't even have collars. Most of them have pink collars. And I also have the distinction because of those individuals without collars and those individuals who with pink collars. I have the distinction of being the first woman of color ever elected in the city of New York, which is a... <laughs> but it's a sad commentary. And it would not have been possible but for New York City's campaign financing system. You see, I was born and raised in New York. I went to college in New York. I worked as a public defender and as an assistant attorney general and then went on to serve as the city council. And, but despite my experience, my passion to serve and my roots in the community, there was one thing I did not have, and that is money. I did not come from a wealthy family. You see, my mother and my father once cleaned halls that looked like this. They struggled each and every day. We were on public assistance. And when my brother got arrested in a criminal justice system where everyone in the court did not look like me other than the defendants, I wanted to reform that system. And I wanted to make sure that every mother and grandmother who steps into a criminal court is never ever respect, disrespected again. And so I ran. And I was able to run successfully because New York City has one of the best public financing matching systems in this country.
Candidates can opt into a small donor matching program which matches small donations up to $175 at a rate of six to one. Six to one. But rest assured, this is not a free-for-all and there are strict rules. There is a cap on the total amount of public funds available to candidates. And there are rules on where the funds can be spent. And at the end of the election, any remaining public funds must be returned to the city. Of who you are, what you do for a living, the significance of you being the first black woman elected to the office you hold, I want to know, and the people that watch this want to know who you are. Sure. So my name is Letitia James. Everyone refers to me as Tish. I'm the public advocate of the city of New York, former city council member, uh, and now the public advocate of the city of New York, and the first woman, woman of color elected in citywide. But to be, to be honest with you, none of that matters. It's all bullshit. The reality is I represent the interest of New Yorkers each and every day. I shake shit up. I go into rooms, and I represent those who unfortunately have been ignored for far too long, those who are locked out of the sunshine of opportunity. I'm not a loyal to um, special interests or to the 1%. Um, and uh, I'm not sympathetic, I'm empathetic because I've walked the walk. I understand challenge, I understand struggle, um, and I understand poverty. I, and uh, it's, uh, we need more individuals like me in public office and we need more women in public office. And that's why it's an honor and a privilege to serve each and every day. I wake up each and every day saying, what can I do to change the life of someone else? Um, and that gets me motivated. And so uh, uh, the public advocate of the city of New York, but more importantly, just the girl next door who gets things done. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Um, my dad was a pastor. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when I'm on with Joy Reid, we talk about Bible stuff. And yes. I, I'm a big critic of the religious right because I yes. come from it. Yeah. And my dad, Francis Schaefer, we used to fly around on Jerry Falwell's private jet. What's your, what's your, what is his name? Francis Schaefer. He was a big time theologian in the 70s and 80s. Oh, I remember. I know the Reverend Schaefer from Brooklyn. And No, different guy. Pro, okay. Pro, Maybe whatever. your relative. Mm -hmm. But I come from that kind of background. Are you, do you have a kind of a churchy past? Yes. Right? Well, not a churchy past. Um, I do, uh, I'm a member, a woman of faith. Um, I do go to church. My church is Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. My pastor is Reverend Anthony L. Trufant. So I come out of the social justice movement. And, um, and because I believe in theology and because I believe in uh, what the civil rights movement, and I know that was based on, um, that was, uh, based on um, the activism in the black church. And so it's that activism um, and that commitment, um, uh, that commitment to social justice, um, that's what inspires me. And I look forward to listening to a good sermon and now and then it gets me going, gets my blood flowing. What do you make of all these white evangelical voters who, without whom Donald Trump, who is our first openly racist president for about 100 years, there have been plenty of racist presidents, but this guy doesn't even pretend. So he's not only racist, he's a misogynist. And yeah, and he, in the Nixon administration, had to sue him to get him to rent apartments to people of yes, color. So yes. what's the deal here with white Christians who say they follow Jesus? Because unfortunately they vote against their interests and because they vote on one issue, their single issue people and it's pro-life. And so I think we need to think about the life of individuals, uh, of individuals who are currently living in poverty. Um, I think we need to think about those who are homeless today. Mm -hmm. I think we need to think about our country. Uh, I think we need to think about um, those who are struggling right now and those who unfortunately are hiding in the margins and hiding in the shadows. That to me is our uh, the moral message, and so we got to heal the breach, um, and the breach right now is between our government and um, our and its people. And so I urge evangelicals and all individuals who believe um, that God that uh, that that our God is a God who loves others, and particularly those who are different, and who feeds people, um, who is who c can comfort the naked and comfort the homeless, and comfort the immigrant who comes to our country seeking freedom and democracy. Um, that's what we need to think about. And that, to me, is more consistent with my God. You know, speaking as an old white fart who came out of the religious right, that it is about time that people who look like you, act like you, have your passion, are running this country. I, I genuinely believe that from my heart. That's where the hope is. So I want you to talk a little bit about your vision as a public figure and a public leader and a human being for where you really think we need to go in this era of both division but also tremendous corruption. Um, just share a little bit of that with me. I think we need more courageous individuals in public office and I think we need to uh, speak about issues that can, that can tie us together um, because we are inextricably tied to one another. We're tied to one another uh, by our strength of our humanity. 
Um, and so it's, for me, it's really critically important that we address unemployment, underemployment, and those who are struggling, particularly uh, since manufacturing and the um, manufacturing and, and um, industry has left our country, and I don't think it's coming back. We need to talk about our environment. We need to talk about women. We need to talk about children. We need to talk about men who are standing on the corner right now looking for jobs. Uh, we need to talk about the union movement and how the union movement was the single greatest tool in addressing mm. poverty and despair. Mm. Um, that's what we need to talk about. And so. Um, as a public advocate, I'm just someone who cares and someone who's compassionate. Mm -hmm. And being a woman of color, the first woman of color is important, but it means nothing. It's nothing more than a historical footnote. The question is, what do you do with this power? And mm -hmm. that really is the issue. I need, uh, right now I'm in office really because I want to chance, transform lives. And that's what I do every day. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a compelling case for the great reform organization, the Centrist Project. And the billionaire says, oh, this is fabulous. I, I love this. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I gotta ask for 10 million instead of 1 million. <laughs> but before I can get the words out, the billionaire says, count me in for $25,000. <laughs> so this is a problem. Because if politics is our single greatest challenge of a nation, then political innovators like this room should be generating massive investment. <coughs> But that hasn't been happening at the scale we need. So Michael Porter and I joined forces to try to work on this. And we analyzed politics using the tools of industry structure and competitive thinking that Michael actually invented decades ago. These tools shed new light and help people and potential investors understand how politics really work. I'm Jennifer Rogers. I run the Center for the Advancement of Public Integrity at Columbia Law School. We are a nonprofit research and resource center for public integrity professionals. And how do you see what you do? I listened to you speak today. How does it fit in with what's going on here at Unrig the System, which is this group that I don't fully understand what they do, but all the people here kind of are concerned about money and politics, corruption, all of that. Can you sort of talk about that? Well, what we do is really try, we try to help people inside government to keep an eye on government. So we do a work in the, the public ethics and anti-corruption space for oversight and enforcement professionals. So these are government watchdog entities who try to stop fraud, waste, and abuse inside of government. So that's, that's basically the core of our audience. And we try to help them through programming, through publications, how-to guides, best practices, you know, other resources so that people can keep an eye on their government officials and make sure that they're governing in an honest and accountable way. If you had to explain to someone from another planet what is going on with our system, where someone like the Koch brothers can pour $400 million into the next congressional campaign, all the dark money, Citizens United, you know, someone like me is trying to understand it and I've been involved in politics. How, how would you describe what has happened to our system and what needs to be done if you could just do one thing? Well, the one thing to do would be to get rid of the precedent of Citizens United, either by constitutional amendment or somehow get the court to reverse itself. I mean, really that is the problem because it protects uh, huge campaign donations in the form of free speech. So that's that's really where all the money is coming in through the the hole that has been created through that case. Why did the court do this? I, you know, I, I, I just don't understand how they could possibly think that was a good thing for America. Why did this happen? Why do you really think it happened? Not, you know, personally, why do you think it happened? Well, I think it happened because they gained a Republican majority on the court that didn't see corruption uh, in politics, this kind of legal corruption as a big problem. They didn't see big money in politics as a problem. I mean, Republicans are more likely to be supported by big money, and they just decided it wasn't inherently corruption if big money, uh, where you don't know where it's coming from, it kind of infuses campaigns. How does that dovetail with the whole gerrymandering situation? It seems to me that when you put those two things together, we really have a problem. How do you see those two things fitting together? I'm not talking about a conspiracy. I just mean, in fact, what happens? Uh, I'm not sure that they're that connected, actually. I mean, you know, gerrymandering is obviously a way for to, you know, to compress the majority into a smaller number of districts so that you get more seats. Um, you know, big money in politics is about winning an election with big money. So you're kind of assuming what would otherwise be a contested election, which is kind of 
you know, not what gerrymandering is about. So I'm, I'm not sure that, that they're connected in that way. They're just both very harmful things that are problematic for our country. This morning I was listening to a speaker on your panel who was talking about a case where they had to follow it back and back and back and back from California to find out that the Koch brothers were involved and they had put it through what amounts to a bunch of shell companies, almost money laundering, you would think. I mean, what, what is going on and how is this going to stop? So that was Ann Ravel talking about her time on the, the California Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, you know, I don't know that it's going to stop under our current regime. That's why a lot of people are working against Citizens United. I mean, the point is that you can give to entities where you don't legally have to disclose who's giving and then funnel money to candidates. The Supreme Court says it's okay as long as the candidate isn't coordinating directly with the people spending the money. I think we all know that in actuality, you know, that, that isn't good enough to avoid corruption. We need, the, we need there to be uh, more controls on the money coming in. And you know, I think public financing is a, is a good idea. You'd have a lot less money in politics and politicians would be more accountable. I don't want to put you on the spot, but it, it just seems to me that uh, the Trump era has, has kind of upped the ante on all this. I mean, you know, I know that, that political commentary isn't your thing, but how do you see this moment in history? Because it seems to me, you know, as an old white guy, that it is time for people who look like you to, to take over this country. I'm serious. I put a lot of stock in the women's vote, the women's movement. I don't put much stock in people my age, of my gender, my race doing much. I think we've completely uh, screwed it up. And I, I just wonder, how do you see the Trump era? How does this finish? I, my mind boggles. How have you looked at it? Well, maybe the one silver lining here actually is that the Trump era is so divisive. Um, you know, we're so un uh, not united right now that I think people are getting interested in politics. People are getting motivated for politics. I mean, it's very hard to push against the voter suppression, the gerrymandering, and all of the other problems that are being faced by the Democrats right now, to be honest. But I think that people are getting so motivated that I'm hoping that they'll be able to overcome that. And then once you have enough representation, of course, then you can start to fix things like the gerrymandered districts and so on. So I think it's it's important that, that people get excited about politics or, or angry, you know, whatever, that they get motivated in some fashion to try to take over, to try to run, to try to win these seats so that they can make things fairer for the future generations. Lastly, how can people follow your personal work? Where do we find you uh, out there and, um, you know, online? So we have a website. It's law.columbia.edu backslash CAPI, C-A-P-I. We're the Center for the Advancement of Public Integrity at Columbia Law School, so you could Google and find us that way too. And everything we do is uh, on the website. Thank you so much. Can you tell me who you are, what you do for a living, and what you are doing standing in the middle of New Orleans right now? Hi, I am Anafi Wahed. I am the founder of The Flip Side, theflipside.io. We are your daily digest of the best op-eds and commentaries from social, um, social progressives, liberals, conservatives. We're trying to be a shared news source for people across the political spectrum. So in a world of you know, one billion news feeds, we're trying to give everybody five minutes uh, where they're reading the same thing as their neighbors and their coworkers and their friends. Tell me again what, how people can find this. Just be very specific, yeah, absolutely. spell it out. It's uh, theflipside.io, T-H-E-F-L-I-P-S-I-D-E dot I-O. Um, and you just simply enter your email. We send only one email five days a week at 7 a.m. Uh, so you can read it on your way to work. You can read it when you're trying to take a five minute break and be informed about what's being said on both liberal and conservative sides. And I'm uh, standing here because I'm at Unrig the System, uh, the summit uh, that's being held by Represent.us, and it's bringing together liberals and conservatives to talk about how we can fix gridlock in D.C. and how we can actually make you know, politics something that's about the people, for the people, by the people. Do you deal with the whole issue of corruption in politics, big money, dark money, um, Citizens United, I, I know that that's not what your organization is about, but talk to me about yourself personally, your own political views. Um, well, so full confession, I worked for the Clinton campaign in 2016. I was a field organizer in New Hampshire. Um, I, you know, I'm against Citizen United. I think it should be overturned. Um, I 
I, I have mixed feelings about gerrymandering. Um, I think it's easy to hate on gerrymandering, but it's difficult to come up with a system in which we do have representative government that everybody is happy with. Um, obviously, the politics of that are complicated. Um, how do we change the system while still working within the system? Um, so I haven't actually made up my mind on, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people have proposed solutions to that problem. I'm still making up my mind. Mm. Um, you know, but it's interesting. Uh, I, my team is composed of both liberals and conservatives, and they have very interesting uh, takes. So, you know, we love to hate on Citizen United, but uh, we being Democrats and liberals, but, you know, the Clinton campaign was significantly uh, more well-funded than the Trump campaign, for example. Um, so, on the one hand, yes, there should, should not be money in politics, but one of the encouraging things about the fact that Trump won the presidency is he won it with significantly less funding. He won it despite the fact that, at least in the beginning, the Washington establishment across both parties didn't want him to win. Um, so that's, you know, strangely encouraging to me, even as a Democrat. We were talking over lunch. You said something interesting that goes back to my background in the religious right. Uh, you said, you know, I'm ardently pro-choice, but do people realize what Roe v. Wade and the whole abortion thing has done to the politics? Because we both know people who would be voting Democrat if it wasn't for the abortion issue. And I think a lot of people on the left don't want to admit this, but you had a lot of interesting perspectives on it because you work with so many conservatives, and this may be things that folks who watch my stuff don't want to hear, but uh, listen up. It's worth listening to. Hi. So, yes, as I said, I am... Um I worked for the Clinton campaign. I'm a Democrat. I, I live in New York City. Um, and I talk to a lot of Democrats uh, who are, yeah, to them, the issue has is long closed, right? We, we had Roe v. Wade, and of course I'm pro-choice and everything, you know. And there is, in the Democratic Party, there's a purity test where we don't want to run any candidates, even in the Deep South, in very Republican areas, if they're not as staunchly pro-choice as we want them to be. And I think that's misguided. I think ultimately progress has to come. It, it's not a, it, it can't be one solution fits all. Um, if you're going to represent the people, you actually need to represent the people in your district. We can't run a candidate who feels the same as New Yorkers if they're running in Kansas. Mm. We can't run a con candidate who feels the same as, you know, the Silicon Valley elites if they're running in Missouri. Um, and to me, there's, there's an interesting juxtaposition because when it comes to climate change, we are, we are the party, you know, we're the scientific community party. We're saying, here's all the science that is backing these things for climate change. But Republicans often point out about all of this interesting uh, scientific evidence around uh, when fetuses feel pain, when there's a, there's a lot, it's a moving uh, science as our medical technology is improving and we can actually learn more about what's happening in that nine months uh, before birth. And I think that's something that the left needs to talk about and acknowledge and say, okay, we want to give women choices. Um, I, like I said, I am pro-staunchly pro-choice, but we also need to acknowledge that a lot of people don't feel that way and it, it's it's an issue that's so divisive it's the single issue that is changing people's votes you know um, yeah and it's, it seems to me and it's been underestimated by the left oh yes in this definitely. in the same way that sometimes the right underestimates the fact that when they say something like climate change is a hoax they've just driven a whole group of very sensible people absolutely apeshit exactly those are the issues that are driving voters apart you know those two things I think are so You've rooted in these like uh, very we have gut reactions to them yeah and, and it, that's why maybe we don't talk about it on either side and you don't hear people you know it's interesting that you have chosen to start an organization that doesn't exactly bring people together but does what I don't do so I'm glad you're doing it because I only give my point of view on my blogs and I'm right. pretty I'm pretty much to the left these days but we are going to have to recognize that we are sharing a continent with people we may not like Exactly. But we need somebody like you to be saying at least read what they're writing and don't exactly. just stick to your Facebook friends and their puppy you, dogs and children's pictures and all the rest of it. You have to break out of your echo chambers. When I was knocking on doors in New Hampshire. For you know, Hillary. For Hillary. Um, here I am, you know, first generation South Asian immigrant, grew up in New York. From um, where, by the way? What part from, of, Bangladesh. from Bangladesh. From um, Bangladesh, yeah you know, knocking on the doors of conservatives and moderates and independents in New Hampshire who are rural farmers or who've had, you know, very different life uh, 
life experiences and realities. Um, and that was hard, you know, we have a lot of differences, but one of the things that made it really hard was the fact that, you know, I am watching CNN and MSNBC and the people I'm talking to are watching Fox News and reading, you know, alternative media. Um, that was really hard because we kept, you know, talking past each other. So if I'm only watching Rachel Maddow and you're only watching Tucker Carlson, we're not going to be able to have a conversation. So right. the flip side is trying to be the starting point for conversations to say, okay, you know, uncle at Thanksgiving or coworker or, you know, neighbor across the street, you know, I know that, you know, you probably think this because that's what it said in the National Review. Well, here's what I'm seeing in the New York Times. How can we have a conversation and that's that means something. educated on both sides? So tell me one yeah. more time again, spell it out. Uh, and we'll, we'll, do. Put, we'll put something at the bottom here so people can see it. But awesome. where do we go to find this material you're it's, doing? It's uh, theflipside.io, theflipside.io. Um, it's a daily newsletter, uh, a Monday through Friday. Well, actually, it's not daily, I suppose. It's only yeah. five days a week. Um, I should stop saying that. But <laughs> it's a five-minute email that gets sent to you. You know, you can skim through it. Um, and just get quickly informed on what's being said on both sides about a political issue. And do you issue. try to pick sort of the more intelligent commentary on both sides? Oh, or do you have yes, the absolutely. Crazy we, we have a team of liberals and conservatives who work together. Um, we're reading 20, 30 op-eds a day to really make sure we're bringing our readers the best arguments from both sides because it's easy, you know, there's a lot of clickbait headlines already out there. Yeah. We're really trying to bring the best across Good. both aisles. Well, listen, last thing here. I hope you're the new face of the Democratic Party. When you decide to run for office yourself, bring me on your campaign. I'll go knock on doors for you. That's a promise. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, nice, so good. You said it won't be authentic because you just told me, but I want people to hear it. Just tell me again. And you were on the Hillary campaign and what happened? Yes. So I was campaigning in New Hampshire uh, for Hillary. Um, but to, to give a little background on myself, I grew up in New York City. I am a liberal through and through, you know, lived in my bubble with all of my liberal friends and, you know, up until July 2016, when I decided to quit my job and go to New Hampshire, my friends and I had never met anyone who was voting for Yeah, because for you were making a lot of money. <laughs> yes, I was, I was working in corporate America. I was at Ernst & Young, actually. I was a senior consultant. Um, and we were sitting in our bubble, and we were thinking, oh my god, who are these people that aren't voting for Hillary? This is a crazy you know, phenomenon. We should go investigate. So I decided to go investigate by joining the Clinton campaign. And um, I think everyone has those moments in life where something just clicks, even if it's something you already are aware about or aware of, and something it just hits you in that moment. So it was a it was a rainy day, and it was a very 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 modest home um, in you know rural New Hampshire. And I was knocking on the door. I knew it was a registered Democrat, and my job was to just make sure she has a plan to get to the polls so she can vote for Hillary. So I knock on her door, um, but she opens the door. It's an elderly woman. She's in her 70s, I think. Um, she's disabled, and she says, you know, don't bother. I'm going to stay home or vote for Gary Johnson. I go through my spiel. Uh, Here's why you should vote for Hillary. She has a plan for this and that and, you know, all these other things. And the woman is very kind. She listens to my whole spiel. Um, you know, she's listening intently, but then she just says, I make, uh, I get $400 a month from Social Security. They're going to foreclose on my home because I can't afford my property taxes. If you tell me right now that Hillary has a plan to save my home, to make sure I can, you know, live, continue to living in the home that I grew up in, I will go vote for her. Um, that was a very real moment for me for many reasons. One, the, the fact that they're foreclosing on this, uh, you know, modest home in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. Two, she gets $400 a month from Social Security. And all of the liberals in Silicon Valley and New York who are still wondering how Trump won the election, how 62 million people voted for them, that number is, is so powerful. It's so much more powerful than all the charts we see about income inequality and all the articles we read in The New York Times and Guardian. Um, to stand in front of that woman and not be able to give her an answer, you know. I, it, as far as I know, there was no plan that would save her home. There was no plan that would ensure she gets act, an actual livable amount from Social Security that allows her to pay her taxes and also, you know, food and all the other things. So that's the moment um, that I sort of had 
that really has stuck with me even to this day. And that's why I started the flip side, um, to make sure that the two halves of the country are actually learning about each other, what the other side is reading and listening to, and what are the arguments that, you know, convince them to vote one way or the other, to think one way or the other. Um, it's one thing to read about things in theory. It's another thing to actually witness it. But since I can't make everyone in America stand in front of each other, the best, next best thing I can do is create something that will at least help see both sides, help to see on both sides what's happening to the other side. So tell me a little bit about um, why you're here. Who, first of all, who are you and what are you doing here? Uh, my name is Brian Soybell and I am here directing uh, this show, Un Unrigged Live, which is the, um, it's part of the Unrigged the System Summit that's organized by Represent Us. And my production company is producing um, this show tonight that takes music and comedy and uh, uh, brings them together with uh, political activists and um, performers and um, to, to, yeah, to address uh, the issues of the summit. And I know you're not getting paid for this. When In your day <laughs> job, what do you do that you get paid for? Uh, I, I get paid to write and produce and direct works for the um, uh, theater, film, and television. And just tell me a little bit about that. What have you done? Um, well, we've pr been producing on Broadway for um, the past... Uh, 12 years or so since, yeah, and um, we've produced uh, shows like uh, Douglas Carter Bean's Xanadu, uh, 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 Nick Kroll and John Mulaney's Oh Hello, uh, a show called You're Welcome America with, uh, with Will Ferrell and um, directed by a a Adam McKay. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, did American in Paris recently. Uh, which was on Broadway and all these shows, well not all of them, but shows like Xanadu and American Paris, um, they, they go on to tour around the world, the West End and stuff like that. And um, uh, yeah, and we, on the TV side, we recently um, have been in develop development with HBO and also Entertainment One on some series that my writing partner and I created and I, as, as writers. and. Um, also NBC and um, Stevie Wonder and Quincy Jones. So now why do you jump out of that into something as obscure as Unrigged Live? I mean, where's your heart at in terms of this and how, how do you even know about this? Well, at Mc, Adam McKay, who's uh, on the board and is a friend of mine and also uh, we're working on some, some, some commercial stuff together, he uh, got me hip to represent us. He, um, Expo he invited me to um, some events of theirs and exposed me to their work and um, I I just found it to be really really interesting because I am into result oriented uh, social action you know I, I I am passionate about putting food in people's mouths books in their hands roofs over their heads and um, I am not as interested in um, more theoretical, aspirational, political stuff. And I was moved by Represent Us because I think that they're right, frankly, um, that dealing with this issue, which is uh, so deeply systemic and problematic for uh, a governing body that's obviously supposed to represent the people, um, but who unfortunately um, have uh, been operating in a system in which bribery is not only condoned but is legalized. Yeah, you're talking about the dark money, the huge amounts that people, you know. Yeah, I mean, from the 2010 coast. Citizens United passes and it, it, it turns bribery legal mm -hmm. and super PACs and, and, and all of their um, um, out of control influence is, is born out of that and it's. It's, it's gone out of control, and um, I think, uh, I don't think it's a partisan thing. And frankly, I don't, it's, I don't even necessarily fault individuals because I think the social contract of an ideal democracy is, is that we create a system in which 
people's um, baser selves aren't allowed to take over the process and everyone's human and people are prone to um, uh, prone to um, um, selfishness and uh, and I that's why we're supposed to have a system where people mm -hmm. aren't allowed to do that and so represent us attacks that and deals with that in a real way and that's why I got involved so I originally pitched they said well we want you to do stuff with us I said okay well uh, I make things so why don't we do like a big uh, comedy streaming event you know some big name uh, comedians and people will opt in for a buck or something we raise a lot of money for the cause uh, we batted that around for a while and they said how about for, for the first thing out why don't you direct and, and produce this um, this this event here as, who all, as part who of the summit here tonight you, who'd you bring in uh, well, actually, Represent Us brought most of the people in, people, uh, super political superstars like Nina Turner and Desmond um, Mead and uh, Richard Painter, and um, and then comedians like Nikki Glaser and Adam Yenser, uh, Preservation Hall, Preservation All Stars are mm -hmm. playing, which is a which is everyone's super excited about. Uh, Honey Honey's playing, which everyone's super excited about, and then we brought in Tig Notaro, who's headlining on the comedy side, mm -hmm. and. Um, and you've got some. And, you've got a couple of Hollywood people. Oh yeah, Jennifer Lawrence is hosting. Yep, she's on the board of Represent yeah. Us. Um, and uh, and then we brought in we brought in Rick Steiger, who's a, a, a real real great like veteran Broadway stage mm -hmm. manager. Because um, I was watching the rehearsal, and <laughs> it was interesting because you know I take part in a lot of public events. You know, as much work went into this as you know, I mean, some this is a one night deal. Mm -hmm. But I was very impressed you took the whole afternoon. I sat here watching you and just thinking, wow, this is, they're doing this very, 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 very seriously. Yes. Um, well, that's why... So somebody I mean, cares about this. That, that's the only thing that we can really bring to the table besides besides passion and advocacy. I mean, um, and and financial support is, you know, they, they brought us in to deliver an experience that feels a little bit above and beyond your right. average, you know, yeah. speaking event or something like yeah. that which they've had for the past couple of days so yeah I mean I'd like to do a lot more I'd like to write a fully original show and um, and do a lot of um, uh, a lot more staging and stuff like that but we put all this together in, t in yeah. two two days of tech and um, where can people follow your work I um, mean if there's a way to follow we have your a, work. a, a we have a, um, a a company website triptych studios Dot com that's mm -hmm. T R uh, I P T Y K studios dot com and um, I think we have a Facebook page too. I don't have a lot of time to do the, to do the self promotion. No, because you're doing your own thing. Yeah, right. I mean, I I just I know people find time for it. I I don't, somehow don't. Um, yeah. Part of it is I have a toddler, so I, how, I don't have as how much. Old? Uh, he's two. Oh, and this is good. Well, I'm months. in the grandfather stage. I take care of a three year old all day. Yeah. One of my children lives across the street with three of my grandchildren. Wow. So that's um, fun. Yeah. So that, that's what I do. Let me catch one other thing here. Yeah. So it'll be like, it'll be very dark. All we're giving you is some overhead blue. Um, and then as soon as we see, I mean, plug in, as soon as we see that you're kind of still, uh, voice of God will say, ladies and gentlemen, honey, honey. And <laughs> wow, I've been waiting for that voice. You know, in 2012, Nika Kim. How may I atone? I ask myself these questions silently and inwardly. How may I atone for helping to poison America with certainty addiction? How do I defend my grandchildren against the religious rights juggernaut I helped create? How do I reject what my parents stood for, fundamentalist fanaticism, and yet honor the love they gave me? How can I help my grandchildren stumble upon the goodness of life before they're sold towering mounds of brain-damaging garbage? How do I help save the world? And what kind of deluded messianic fool am I to believe that this is even possible? <laughs>